I'm going to give you an introduction to A-level history at Kevigs, and hopefully it will uh, encourage you to study uh, with us next year for your A-level history. Uh, it's a very, very straightforward course, actually. It's a really nicely structured course. Um, compared with GCSE, GCSE is a little bit complicated with all the different assessment style questions, um, you know, the different papers. This one actually is quite straightforward. It's still AQA, but it runs with Russia uh, on one side and modern Britain on the other side, and they run parallel. So you will learn those across the two years and they just run side by side. Uh, the usual setup is that I teach the modern Britain and that's one I'll talk to you more about today. And Mrs. Melton usually teaches the Russian element of the course. They are equally weighted as you can see. Hopefully, let me see if you can uh, see my screen. Um, you should be able to see my screen. Hopefully, I'm sorry for the... Uh, the confusion here. Um, so they should run side by side, 40% equal weight, and then there's coursework of 20%. The coursework, we try to ensure that it works. It's really important that how it's set up, how it's established the question, the resources that are available, the debate that exists within it works. So what we usually do there is give you free choices, the choices of Tudor rebellions, uh, the shaping of the German nation, and also American uh, West expansionism, which has proved to be really popular in recent years. Um, there is an element there where you can choose your own coursework, but as I've suggested just briefly there, it has to work, it has to be well thought through, uh, and the pitfalls can often come in what is a good idea, but then doesn't have the substance or the resources available, and it also makes it more difficult for us to manage. But there's coursework involved, nothing to panic about there. So two elements. Let's just have a quick through, uh, look through this. Uh, as we suggested, uh, one piece of coursework and two exams, one for the Russia and one for the Britain. Now, the side that I specialise in, my sort of bag that I really enjoy, and it's probably my favourite topic to teach across the whole school, is the making of modern Britain from 1951 to 2007. And in a nutshell, this this consists of the key political, social, economic and also international changes that took place in Britain after the Second World War. And students really enjoy different elements of this. Some really enjoy the social history, a lot of the social norms of that period after the Second World War. Uh, you know, they, they change and they, they dramatically shift as we move into the 1980s. So for example, the institution of marriage, church attendance is a couple of those examples, the social attitude shift. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with the swinging 60s. We look at the political uh, aspects during that period, sort of the conservative dominance at first, 13 years of conservative rule, factorism is in there, new labor. We look at the economic shift as well, uh, keeping it very simple, we have that shift from a manufacturing and industrial factory economy to a tertiary service economy towards the end of the period. You know, that idea that we're sort of the nation's workshop and that shifts, looking at trade union power as well, so some of those shifts. And also internationally, big, big changes there. You know, the idea that after the Second World War, the sun never set on the British Empire. We go through that process of decolonization that's really, you know, speeded up after Macmillan's uh, winds of change speech in. Cape Town in 1960, but also a part of our modern history is that reluctant European as well. And we have a look at that because we know that we didn't join in 57 when the EEC was formed. We were rejected twice under Macmillan and Wilson. We eventually joined under Heath. But by the time we moved to the 1980s, Euro scepticism increases considerably as well. So we look at our relationship with Europe. Um, also in there, very, very interesting as well, is our special relationship, that transatlantic alliance that has been a cornerstone of British uh, foreign policy since the Second World War. So lots of interesting areas to look at. Um, just very quickly running through some elements of the course, we have what's known as the affluent society. Some people term this the golden age with Macmillan, you've never had it so good. Uh, the quote in 1957 at Bedford Football Ground. Uh, so this idea of the golden age, low unemployment, low inflation, um, you know, rising income, uh, affluence, consumerism. So we look at that. Uh, to start with, in quite an interesting area, the motor car and the advent of television. Um, moving on, an area that often interests the students is the swinging 60s. 
uh, and how swinging those were. So we get a lot of liberal reforms. So some of you may be familiar that we have the Abortion Act of 1967. We have the abolition of the death penalty. We have the Divorce Reform Act. So a sort of very liberal time in Britain as well. Uh, and we have a look at Labour because Labour had been out of power for 13 years by that period. And then we have you know, the grammar school boy from Huddersfield, Harold Wilson, as prime minister. So quite an interesting period as well. But some of Britain's economic problems start to appear uh, during that period as well. They're underneath the surface. They're evident if you look in that 51 to 64 period, but they start to surface in that period as well. Um, we then move on to uh, look at the 1970s, which are very troublesome and turbulent in Britain as well. Um, um, and we see this rise in trade union power. Edward Heath has problems with the miners, and then we see that this also moves into the public sector unions under the Labour government, 74 to 79. And then we move on to look, and I will try and go fairly quickly, to look at uh, Thatcherism, really, really interesting area, and one that uh, shouldn't be neglected, a prime minister that very much divides opinion, but in terms of her electoral success, nobody can deny it. She won in 79, she won again in 83, she won again in 87, but she was ousted by her own party in 1990 and fell from power. And there's those tearful scenes of her leaving Downing Street, as you can see. European leaders couldn't understand how she could be deposed by her own party. She never lost a general election, but a very divisive prime minister. And then we move on to the era of New Labour. A lot of you will uh, be familiar with New Labour for the Iraq War as well, a very controversial war in 2003, supporting George W. Bush, and that was in a sense regardless of the large-scale opposition that existed. So what we try to do is cover the British political and economic circumstances first of all, then we also then look at British society and British foreign policy. Um, we're very, very res well resourced within the department. I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with the History Library. You'll certainly walk past it. The course is mapped out exceptionally well for independent learning. All aspects of the syllabus are mapped out against uh, the textbooks. There's links there for uh, supported learning uh, for any sort of uh, uh, online video resources that are out there as well. Um, Okay, moving on just very quickly. The Russia, this is more Mrs. Melton's side of the course, and Miss Maidman's taught it this year as well. So I won't talk too much about this. However, we'll just have a quick look through some of the Russia. Uh, the first part of the course is really looking at Alexander II and also then Alexander III that are trying to preserve the existing order, the autocracy, the rule under the Tsars. Uh, and they're trying to preserve that. Alexander is trying to change to conserve. So you see the emancipation of the serfs being a good example of that. And then you see Alexander III to repressive policies to try and maintain autocracy as opposition is rising. Um, we then look at that time of Nicholas II, where there is the collapse of the Tsarist regime and eventually the Bolshevik uh, seizure of power after the fall of the provisional government. So quite dramatic changes, and it's nice to uh, experience and have a look at that uh, Russian revolution of uh, 1917. Um, and then what we will look at then is Lenin's period in power, uh, the establishment of a communist dictatorship, and then we move forward to look at the Stalinist dictatorship where we see the, the, the show trials, the purges, the collectivization, the industrialization, uh, very rapid under Stalin and, you know, establishing that cult of the personality as well. And also the, the ability to defeat the Germans during the Second World War, which then strengthened his grip on power. So lots and lots of interesting areas to look at. Uh, that's the end of that presentation. All I would ever say to you is please, please come forward, ask questions. If you wish to know more, then, you know, just get in touch. Just come and see us. We're always available over in Foundation House. You'll often, you know, find me sort of living in H2. Uh, you can always email questions. You just get in touch and, you know, and don't be afraid to ask. We're a very popular A-level. I think our A-level history class is the biggest uh, a a year 12 class in school this year. Um, it's a very, very solid A-level. 
Uh, it's one that's highly respected by uh, you know, different organisations, universities, employers, as it's just one of those traditional solid A levels where you have to learn to be able to construct coherent arguments. You have to have a range of points. You have to find balance. You have to reach judgment. A lot of skills that uh, employers are always, always looking for, somebody that can articulate their argument well. Okay, so I'm going to end the, uh, the promotional video there, and if you have any questions, then please get in touch, and I will try and answer those the best I can. Uh, thank you for uh, listening.